So again, uh, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Hemant Jain, uh, Max Finley Chair in the College of Business uh, at UTC. And it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you all for this webinar series, uh, Finley Chair webinar series, uh, which we started from this year. And this is the second seminar in the, in, in the webinar series. And the objective of this series is basically to bring in the top researchers uh, in, the, in the technology and business area uh, from all around the world. Uh, and so we try to bring them and we actually try to bring the people who are doing interesting and a lot more applied work uh, for that. Also, we, we try to bring in the people who will attract a wide variety of audiences. And so we target faculty from different colleges, students from various colleges at UTC, uh, many executives from different uh, local industries and partner companies, uh, community members uh, who are interested in attending. And I'm happy to report that uh, uh, we get very good participation in these first two seminars. In both seminars, we had more than 50 people uh, um, attending these seminars. And all of this is uh, made possible by the generous gift from uh, Max Finley family, uh, which is sponsored my chair here. And so I'm very happy that the webinar series has been going so successfully. Uh, and we hope to continue that with this kind of wonderful presenters uh, coming in uh, through the web uh, or maybe at some point uh, physically on the campus. Uh, but without any delay uh, for today, I'd like to speak, um, introduce to you Dr. Amit Set. Dr. Amit Set is the founding director of the AI Institute at the University of South Carolina. As he was just telling us, that's a multidisciplinary institute uh, which cuts across all the different uh, colleges and schools at the university and works closely with the industry. Uh, Amit obviously is very well known educator, researcher, and entrepreneur. So he combines all three in one. He loves obviously teaching students and uh, uh, really take pride in success of his students. He's a very high caliber researcher. And more interestingly is that he's an entrepreneur. He has started four different startup companies based on his research work. Uh, so it's wonderful. I've known Amit for many, many years uh, through our association at the IEEE Service Computing Conference. Uh, Amit got uh, a, the you know, Research Innovation Award last year from IEEE Service Computing Conference. And he presented a keynote address at the IEEE Service Computing Congress this year, uh, which is obviously very well established Congress. Uh, uh, of the IEEE. So without any delay, I'll hand it over to Amit uh, to start his presentation. It's a great pleasure. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I think uh, for me, uh, talking about the subject uh, um, is in itself exciting. Um, now, um, I signed up or I, I gave this title as for my talk um, uh, so clearly the industrial uh, component of uh, you know industrial application component of ai is uh, at the center of what i want to talk about or i wanted to talk about and also uh, you know ai as it is practiced now um, as it is changing and uh, in the distant future now um, it just so happens that um, from the email I got from uh, Chancellor uh, Engel, um, I, reflecting on that, I chose to do a little bit of bait and switch. And um, instead of talking just about um, what is the state of the art of AI application in the industry, I thought, see, you know, uh, that I should talk a little bit more about um, uh, the role of academia in industry AI industry applications, and uh, through our own example of what we are doing now, 
uh, and uh, in that how it will more impact the near term rather than now i could talk i'll talk more about near term in the sense by giving you concrete example of actual uh, academic industry collaborations happening now and if necessary i can describe my own companies there are three of the companies i uh, founded um, are based on ai uh, research and technologies so i'll talk a bit about state of the ai from industry perspective uh, then I'll talk about AI applications in AI industry. Uh, and uh, in that process, I'll weave in uh, the campus wide AI Institute at the University of South Carolina and uh, how it has fit into uh, our activities where um, applications to business industry uh, has come out very well. So in the recent years, uh, Growth of AI can be largely attributed to huge growth in data. Uh, we've been collecting data uh, in many, many different ways. Whether you are collecting data of customer behavior at your website, or we are uh, we have Internet of Things, roughly you know uh, tens of billions of Internet of Things are constantly monitoring uh, uh, the physical world and our factories uh, and automation and robots and collect and creating data. And uh, we start using smartwatch and we start using you know, smartphone, they all collect the data all the time. So that they, with the data being collected at a very rapid pace, our ability to analyze the data has not kept uh, a pace. There was an estimate, uh, uh, almost a decade old, that uh, of all the data being collected, uh, which are in petabytes and exabytes, exabytes and uh, you know beyond that zettabytes, that um, less than half of one percent of the data actually get analyzed. And the rate at which data is you know collection has increased, that percentage has further gone down. Right? So there's so much data. But our ability to collect, you know, analyze the data is a is, is struggle. And AI is that technology which um, uh, is really has become powerful because of availability of more data. It has uh, taken massive amount of computational power, but that has uh, physical computational power has grown very fast uh, uh, or quite fast. Uh, the human power uh, has not grown that fast and cannot grow that fast. So the need for technology has grown uh, very, very, you know, uh, rapidly. Um, so information is cheap, data is, you know, collected, but understanding insights from that, that you can act upon, that businesses can act upon and make decisions, that has um, uh, really suffered. Now, um, the role of AI and how the businesses um, see the, um, role of AI uh, is captured in this couple of quotes on this and the next slide. Uh, here, um, CEO of Bain Capital says, um, every company is an AI company. And um, it's not just a particular technology company. It could be a supply chain company. It could be, um, you know, every signal, uh, se sector is just not technology. It could be health and, and so on and so forth. Um, Hemant told me that you have logistics, manufacturing, health insurance, uh, uh, other companies like broader company like Tennessee Value Authority uh, with a lot of data and, and decisions to be made. Uh, they are, you know, all these kind of companies also uh, see the role of AI in what they need to do. Uh, here is the new CEO of Krishna. I think he was, you know, he became CEO last year. Uh, so he says every company will be AI and AI company is saying, but uh, uh, you can take either of the um, quotes and uh, see the role, importance of AI. And the AI has both, um, you know, societal drivers and it is a bunch of, you know, technical areas uh, for where it makes value, uh, brings value. So um, the societal drivers are very broad, very you know, all encompassing, as you can see on the left side of the picture. Um, one very interesting thing 
to notice is that um, in a short period, rather short period, um, the whole market has changed. In 2001, you see uh, all the um, companies um, are uh, now what you call as old style companies. You know, there's a G uh, in manufacturing, automation, and such uh, in industrial company. <clears throat> Microsoft was the ex uh, lone exception of a technology company. Exxon, uh, City Bank, Walmart, right? In 2006, not much had changed yet, but you see um, in even 2011, uh, there was now only Apple as a technology company. Look at 2016 in five years. <clears throat> From, you know, one company uh, as top uh, five, all the companies became top, you know, all the, all the top five companies were, were technology companies. And not just that, the the well their valuation uh, has far outstripped uh, the valuation of all the non technology companies so the gap is pretty big now <clears throat> and this has you know stretch uh, quite a bit right so you buy the companies like qualcomm and you know many many other companies that have very high valuation other interesting thing here is that um, um, what you should know about ai from uh, you know uh, is that in the US, so called G Mafia, Google, Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, IBM, uh, and Amazon, and China's bat, <clears throat> Baidu, um, Alibaba, Tencent, um, and, and there is one more company, the four very big, big company. They, um, uh, you know, have vastly invested in AI. So, um, if you if you try to characterize them and what they call themselves and characterize themselves, they basically say, "Well, we are AI machine learning company," or that is what really um, uh, you know gives them the edge and and the growth. <clears throat> it's still, in, interestingly, even for the non technology company, if you look at the investment and their projection, significant marginal growth come from uh, AI, or is expected to come from use of AI. So um, here are, you know, uh, corresponding land, then AI investment have continued to grow very rapidly. So you can see that total investment um, in AI, and we are talking about, you know, just um, 2015 to 2019, or just uh, uh, four or five years of span, uh, and that growth is, is, is massive. Similarly, investment in AI, um, in the, uh, you know, and growth in, uh, you know, sorry, the uh, active growth of uh, top target companies, uh, and these are AI related figures. Again, that is very, very fast. Now, uh, <clears throat> uh, there is a little different uh, uh, picture when you look at the skills gap. So. Uh, while U.S. has a huge domination uh, in in industry, <coughs> the other companies have some uh, you know uh, end up a, a advantage um, in the skills. So <clears throat> by growing the skills, uh, you know having more skills, uh, they they are poised to progress very fast. <coughs> A little over a decade ago, I, I had uh, over three years, I had um, um, an opportunity to talk to Narendra Modi, uh, our current prime minister in India. And I gave them the example of uh, Google in 2008 <clears throat> or nine. I said, Indians, uh, in, India's economy was 1.1 trillion, but a Google, a, a silicon based company in, in, in less than a decade, had a market valuation of 100 billion, one tenth the <clears throat> GDP of an entire uh, 1.3 billion, uh, you know, uh, uh, a country with 1.3 billion people. And the important thing is that while I understood uh, he knew how uh, the capital investment work and capital intensive industry worked, uh, it is a skills based industry uh, that, um, uh, you know, is. Uh, 
in, in the knowledge economy that is really uh, uh, allowing this growth. <clears throat> so uh, roughly first 1000 people that Google hired were almost all PhDs. And it was uh, a lot of it is was, um, you know, contributed by higher education uh, institutions around that. So I was, you know, encouraging uh, him to invest in uh, research universities. Now, um, there is a, um, whenever there is opportunity for digitization of big data, uh, you see growth in um, AI. So this is, um, you know, uh, is portraying AI impact as percentage of total impact derived from analytics <clears throat> and AI impact in, uh, in, in billions. Uh, and you can see some of the sectors that are um, uh, ahead and others uh, are, are not that, that far along. But this is changing also very fast. So even the ones that are on the, uh, so healthcare, for example, uh, is always a laggard from technology perspective and is, is a uh, laggard from uh, AI perspective. But uh, the likely, uh, uh, you know, changes uh, in AI uh, in healthcare is uh, going to, you know, there be significant changes in healthcare that will be due to AI and, and associated technologies. And uh, you, uh, US has a challenge. Um, uh, <clears throat> that it cannot count on being, uh, you know, the, the um, top, uh, you know, uh, country in the world uh, in AI. Um, in research, U.S. is still ahead, but um, uh, I can attest myself uh, through having visited places and such that in terms of development and monetization, other countries are doing exceptionally well. Now, U.S. has taken note of that, and there have been uh, national initiatives that have started. NSF has a whole bunch of, uh, you know, initiatives like AI institutes that are <clears throat> funding in AI uh, and and uh, that um, is still likely to continue for next few years at least the next three to five years um, there'll be uh, um, unusually high investment in AI as from everything that we can say where is AI right now uh, you know where where are we in the evolution of AI and so this this uh, is a very good um, uh, I think a uh, high level view, uh, I, I'm building upon what DARPA has said, that the first wave of AI, um, well, you know, is described as uh, symbolic AI. Um, I happen to be working in AI in that area uh, in those times. I, in 1988, I had a $1.6 million DARPA project uh, called Database and AI Integration. I won't go into technical aspects of it, but in those days, we used to handcraft the knowledge. We used to build expert systems and such. And um, there was um, a, a hype and euphoria, which uh, uh, AI was not able to then support. And because of that, there was a, a period which is um, uh, called, I think, um, you know, a, a black, uh, a period where uh, AI uh, really uh, was on back burner. People did not believe AI is a significant um, uh, will, will ever deliver on the promise. So, uh, but then things started to change at the start of this century and machine learning, learning came on board and um, <clears throat> machine learning, deep learning are, uh, you know, uh, type of AI which are characterized as statistical AI. So the idea is that you have very large amount of data and you are learning from the data, you're not handcrafting knowledge. And with the uh, associated increase in computing power, uh, there was uh, a, a not only a very rapid growth in AI technique and technologies, but also it showed real world prom you know, promise to solve real world problems. So there are class of problems that AI solves now very well. In fact, there are class of problems where AI is, uh, has shown to do better than human level of performance. I'll also say towards the end of my lecture that uh, there are also class of problems where AI still fall falling quite short and I'll try to characterize them as part of overall picture. And then now we have started to enter the third way of AI. Uh, it is also called neurosymbolic AI, which is essentially or a hybrid AI in, and, and um, uh, people with, with significant progress in statistical AI, we have uh, figured out the limitations of that. 
and uh, one of the big limitation is that uh, these techniques are black box techniques they don't they can't explain how they came up with that result and hence uh, there is a lack of trust in ai uh, because of the lack of uh, explainability 91 percent of the companies according to a survey made on behalf of ibm the last survey says that uh, <clears throat> they want explainability so uh, while uh, there has been a lot of successes at the same time um, some in some applications ai is hitting the wall because experts and you know people in humans in the in those discipline uh, are resisting accepting ai because uh, the decision process of ai techniques uh, cannot be uh, is not transparent so we are building new class of technology and uh, my own research is heavily invested in that we call knowledge infused learning which is uh, you know course and we hope will be centerpiece of this new symbolic ai processing but the ability to explain um, is, is a very important thing and be more adaptable as humans are and this kind of thing. So more human-like capabilities is what the next generation of AI will try to achieve. There are many areas of, uh, some areas of AI and I simply won't have time to discuss that. Um, and, but the important thing is that uh, the revolutionary uh, role of AI is not in isolation that um, its ability to draw insight um, uh, is uh, going hand in hand with internet of things or sensors, biotechnology, behavioral science or psychology, um, digital payment, and many other things. Thus, uh, it's extremely critical to put together multidisciplinary teams in solving many of the problems. Now, uh, a little brief introduction to the uh, AI Institute, um, I, I, it's not my main purpose to discuss the AI Institute, but the derivative of, uh, you know, the kind of work we do uh, from the AI Institute with uh, industry, uh, you know, and business uh, implication impact is what I'm going to talk about. So translational research with never, nearly all colleges, in, uh, you know, at the university is uh, one of the very significant um, uh, uh, hallmark of, of what we have already achieved in two years. So what do we do at UFFC? Uh, you know, we turn big data into smart data. But, um, um, you know, <clears throat> here is the overall kind of uh, strategy that we have pursued. Core of what we do is research and innovations, of course. We are an academic, you know, part of academia, and we do that. And uh, we also want to broaden the access to AI. Uh, so educational innovation is very important. Um, uh, I, uh, I, I, uh, you know, uh, help uh, crystallize the AI certificate um, uh, for our master's program. But uh, recently, uh, we started to work on interdisciplinary AI degree program. And in this particular case, um, uh, while there are growing number of programs where computer science students can specialize in AI, and uh, you know, there may be AI uh, related uh, degree programs uh, taken by computer science students. Uh, I want to uh, particularly emphasize the ability for uh, non-computer science students, especially non-computer science bachelor students, to pursue graduate studies uh, at the intersection of their own uh, undergraduate uh, domain or area and AI. So that is what we characterize by it, uh, master's and PhD in international AI. Uh, we are thinking of PhD because we have very large amount of research. Uh, but uh, important, uh, uh, more important is the masters, uh, because um, I have increasingly seen that um, our graduates, for example, from mechanical engineering, or civil engineering, or electrical engineering, or uh, even uh, you know education and other things, uh, are being hired in the jobs that require uh, AI uh, experience and skills, or from a pool of, let's say, 10 graduating students, um, uh, one or two get hired in the jobs where AI is playing a uh, significant role at the um, salary and compensation that is 50 to 100% higher than their uh, counterpart doing in the same domain. So for example, in biology and psychology and so many of these disciplines, um, uh, the, um, you know, the salaries and such have not grown that much. 
But if you happen to apply, uh, you know, bring your domain knowledge and also have AI knowledge, you are, uh, you know, really in huge demand and you get much higher salary and, and very exciting jobs and such. So I want to uh, make that mo make more of that possible at the university level. And that's one reason why we're going for this inclusive AI, um, you know, research. And I have partners in, um, you know, psychology or, or, or in uh, College of Art. I have partners in College of Engineering, uh, partners in um, uh, social sciences and, 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 and in engineering, particularly mechanical and other engineering. Uh, in materials and manufacturing that are import, you know, uh, that, that are core to this uh, interstellar AI uh, push. Now, I, uh, as Simon said, I've done, um, you know, um, uh, uh, startups and uh, founded companies. Uh, three of them are, uh, you know, using licensing technology developed in my own lab, and three of them in AI. So the last one I founded was, is the Cognovi Labs in 2016. I did not join the company in operational capacity, but I saw on the board. Um, but uh, I brought the technology to really commercial grade before we went out to start the technology. So uh, that made it much easier to get the investment and all the things and companies doing well, very well. And, and three of my students that I train as part of my research are the main technical people for the company. So, so, the, so you know, in a way, wonderful thing, the university got, um, uh, probably uh, you know three hundred thousand or more in licensing fees so far, and we'll probably get more. So it has been a wonderful win-win for what we have done. Another company I founded before that was uh, AI, uh, you know, a, 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 in natural language processing for clinical applications or clinical NLP, and that company was acquired earlier this year, and it did fantastic for for the for 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 everybody involved in the company. Um, uh, and uh, the one before that was a very major company um, uh, uh, from my, you know, from a technical perspective. In year two, 1999, I started a company. Google did when it came out with the semantic search. In the 2012 and 13, Google came out with the entirely new form of search called semantic search, where you type a name of some person and something will show up on the right hand side. If you type Steve Engel, you see that his profile from Wikipedia will come on the side. So it is using knowledge. And um, we pioneered that technology. We had the first pattern in that area in 2000. So we built the first search engine um, using AI uh, techniques in that those days. But what is happening increasingly is that we are doing technology development and a lot of real world applications and engaging industry as a process, which I will show you for whatever time I have. So. Uh, as I was preparing for this talk, I just put down all the uh, work we are doing, and uh, I myself am, you know, I guess uh, surprised that uh, we are already doing project with all of these things, uh, and we started only in 2019. And in each of the cases, uh, we have funded research projects, so it's not or industry research funded project. So it's not just saying we are doing project for you know, uh, enlightenment, there's is, there is something really concrete and business centric for in all of these things. Let me give you a few, a few examples, uh, you know, I'll have to do that uh, quickly, uh, but um, let's see. Um, so the first uh, uh, area that I'm talking about is automated planning, uh, very relevant to the logistics uh, that happens in uh, Chattanooga area, uh, smart manufacturing and factory of future. So we currently have uh, three funded projects, maybe four funded projects um, in, in this area. And you know, in the bottom, you'll see uh, kind of uh, the growth uh, from the industry perspective, the market uh, uh, you know, size of AI in manufacturing. And most of the time you see uh, uh, a CAGR uh, of uh, 20 plus percent, which is tremendous. Um, uh, let's see, so uh, you know, here, um, the first example I'm uh, going to talk about is a project with uh, uh, BMW. Now, uh, clearly, you know, I'm giving an overview talk, so I'm not going to go into technical details of anything. Anybody is interested, is interested, I'm more than happy to uh, go into that. But basically, you know, BMW is an example of many companies. They have complex supply chain uh, comprising of thousands of material numbers and hundreds of suppliers. And a lot of things have, um, you know, uh, it also changed. In fact, one of the uh, push for uh, uh, thinking about AI uh, was COVID-19. 
uh, you know, um, that uh, supply chain, I mean, we hear about supply chain problem every day now, right? I mean, uh, you know, even President Biden talked about it yesterday. And that is lead to inflation, right? So, um, um, you know, the what, you know, the time it took for you to, for, for BMW to get its parts from um, other countries uh, like uh, Mexico and even other, uh, beyond that, uh, have become a lot uncertain and longer, right? So, uh, so there is a big uh, challenge with the supply chain uh, that like any other company BMW is facing. Uh, so they have a, um, a material planner, as you can see on the top left, um, uh, that tries to do all that. But the amount of uh, variables, changes, variability of, of, of information uh, is just too much. And so uh, as part of this project with the AI, uh, there is a AI material planner assistant uh, that is being developed, uh, is uh, already being developed um, on the way. So we we have done a thorough um, inventory of all the parts they have and uh, got the extraction of the data and the data model and um, now uh, we are employing uh, you know the uh, material planner um, uh, in the technology uh, to really do the uh, planning and you know help with the decision making and take a strategy such that we can also uh, give the planner a different insight. So we are not talking about taking the planner out of the loop, but we are certainly making planner a lot more efficient and we are certainly taking care of um, a lot of data processing that goes that uh, planner otherwise would be uh, doing with a rather outdated software. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, so, so broadly, and, and the other thing is that, um, there's increasing desire uh, for incorporating more parameters, more variability that is happening now. They, they, you want to make the system more adaptable, more flexible. And for with that comes the need to incorporate more and more variable like border and custom data and the delays and the changing regulations, like weather uh, thing, like warehouse capacity, like traffic. All these things are currently not being modeled and there's no capacity to collect the data automatically and use it uh, in the current system, uh, and that is um, so. But but with more digitization, more data collection, now the AI uh, is ready to help you out. Other area is um, uh, future factories, so uh, smart production logistics, but also um, deploying um, uh, smart data and cloud infrastructure, um, use the stand standards and so on and so forth. So one of the very popular concept is digital twin where you can virtually commission what happens in the physical world, you have a digital counterpart of that. And you can simulate everything that happens in the digital world, in, so in the physical world into digital world, because you can mount all kinds of, you know, sensors on the shop floor, on, in, or, you know, or any, any part of the, uh, uh, you know, production process. And hence you can recreate that whole thing in um, the virtual world and you can, uh, you know, take care of that. So. Um, being able to collect all the data and uh, then create digital world where you can manipulate things much more easily and then uh, translate those uh, decisions into the physical world manufacturing automation is what is is one of the things that we are working on uh, there is a video here and that video basically shows uh, that um, uh, you know uh, the digital twins concept and essentially how um, you know the parts are being um, uh, collected and uh, passed over to the uh, next, um, uh, you know, robot and how robots call, uh, you know, communicate and uh, how the entire process is understood in a uh, in a in a uh, in a real time in the virtual world <clears throat> is this concept of, um, you know, uh, uh, digital twins and and uh, and there are many many uh, contexts of data creation uh, acquisition. Uh, analysis, decision making, error handling, uh, adaptation, and all that that go on in this process. So, so the AI gets heavily applied in this kind of uh, activities. Uh, very briefly, autonomous vehicle. So, oh, by the way, so so these um, you know uh, uh, projects that we have funded range from a National Science Foundation project. Uh, 
uh, with um, research uh, focus, with another National Science Foundation with education focus, uh, NASA EPSCOR uh, project, as well as uh, our uh, state funded uh, industry collaborative project with Siemens and uh, some other partners. Um, in the, um, uh, you know, autonomous vehicle, uh, and that is a very uh, large, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, growing market. Um, uh, there are many, many issues where AI play a role, but one of the most important uh, role that AI can play is uh, that of perception or scene understanding. So, in fact, expressive unified representation of driving scene um, <clears throat> and AI can play a very, very important role. So, this is a project with Bosch and, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, the uh, uh, you know, there are certain core competitions that my group has, uh, that AI Institute has, uh, that of using knowledge about um, the scenes in addition to statistical, uh, you know, computing, AI computing that is in using vision, uh, data processing in computer vision. So by combining the two, we have come up with more, uh, you know, exciting strategy. And uh, just, uh, I think a month or two ago, the a CEO of, uh, you know, um, uh, Bosch, uh, uh, you know, research part of it, um, uh, wrote a blog about this work. So it's pretty high, uh, visible, uh, you know, work in the project. Uh, and, and essentially, um, uh, it is doing a lot of exciting things. Um, uh, for example, uh, how do you predict uh, potentially unrecognized Entity. So, suppose a, uh, a ball comes on a uh, road, um, a human would, you know, kind of uh, become cautious and um, can, uh, you know, imagine that if the ball is thrown, maybe there are people around that. And that kind of, you know, thing is very natural for human to do, but it's very, very hard for uh, current technology to do. So, how do we bring in that kind of uh, ability to think about such things? that humans are so good at making the associations and causality and other things um, the, into uh, the autonomous, uh, or, you know, the scene, scene understanding uh, problem is the core of the work that we are doing. Healthcare, public health and life sciences. Um, uh, here, uh, as you can see and comment I made, uh, the growth is uh, expected to be very, very high. Uh, 38 uh, percent CAGR is 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 huge, um, and some of the areas can be totally transformed. For example, uh, during the COVID, um, virtually all mental health uh, care became uh, telehealth and virtual care uh, health, right? And once it became virtual or tele, uh, you now have digital data, and hence now you have the ability to infuse AI, right? So that that is becoming and this is a snapshot, uh, it's already old. There's so many companies in healthcare. Uh, these are all startups in healthcare that are transforming, uh, you know, uh, healthcare using AI. Uh, now, in, in, uh, there are parts of, uh, you know, uh, healthcare um, market which is totally being transformed and uh, for a good reason. Uh, so, uh, because of the massive success of the current generation of AI uh, in computer vision, particularly, you know, understanding of radiology images. Um, they can do that better than humans can do. Um, uh, the, uh, you know, screening method in uh, cancer uh, is being revolutionized. And, and this is not research, this is actual deployment. So there are companies that have uh, you know, startups uh, using AI to detect breast cancer, uh, and uh, just for that, there are these startup. Similarly, I can name the startups to in all different kinds of cancers, all different types, uh, you know, of healthcare involving use of radiology, and 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 such. So, and the clinical trials uh, starting and so on and so forth. So, uh, this one is kind of already a success story, and we are not going back. Similarly. Um, uh, device manufacturing, uh, medical device manufacturing is also getting changed quite a bit. One of the things that has, is um, not yet changed much, but where there is a lot of uh, research and not only research, but sort of trials, clinical trials and evaluation being done, is this area of personalized digital health, 
uh, uh, there's also area called quantified self. So uh, many people wear smart watches and some of the people, some of the reason, uh, you know, one, one, one reason that people have to go to smart watches because it is, it, it is, it can increasingly do, uh, you know, uh, can help you with your healthcare. Uh, not only takes, uh, you know, I, it tells you about how many, um, you know, steps you took, uh, but increasingly uh, you're going to be able to, uh, set, you know, do, um, you know, blood pressure measurement and possibly just this morning we had a talk uh, that involved uh, development of technology for um, uh, blood sugar uh, estimation without, uh, you know, uh, without uh, drawing the blood, without, without pricking your finger. So um, uh, those are going to become broadly available and increasingly patients are getting more and more data. And with, um, you know, the Obamacare, uh, there is more interest in patient empowerment. And um, uh, the idea is to develop systems where um, uh, patients are more, uh, you know, themselves are part of the uh, healthcare and, and managing the health rather than simply rely on clinicians. So uh, 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 a few years ago, I, I, I laid out this, um, uh, uh, initiative or idea I call augmented personalized health, uh, different levels at which a technology can help uh, you patients themselves or even non patients, but any healthy individual man manage their health better. Uh, it starts with self monitoring, uh, you know, monitoring health related data, self appraisal, understanding how well you're doing with regards to your disease that you want to control, let's say in a clinical, in, in, a, in a chronic disease situation, self management given a uh, discharge summary or, or healthcare plan that you have decided with the healthcare at your last doctor's visit, how do you optimally keep, uh, you know, following those things and not fall out of, uh, you know, don't take and make good daily decisions to keep up with your uh, health care plan. Uh, uh, intervention when things are not going as planned, how do you incorporate, uh, you know, clinical care and disease progression tracking. So with that, we uh, started doing, um, you know, a variety of projects. Uh, uh, let me just tell you about one project, which is very exciting. Uh, this is a project uh, um, of uh, asthma, but uh, sorry, so, the, so we work with a whole lot of projects. You know, I, I think we work with the majority of the chronic diseases or largest disease. Uh, we work with um, cardiovascular health. We work with mental health, asthma, uh, nutrition, uh, and nutrition is relevant in many diseases. And one of the technological piece that we work on is this virtual health assistant. So we develop a whole, uh, you know, variety of health assistants. Uh, some of them have also involved as have also involved uh, patient evaluations. So let me give you and an, you know, that market is growing again very fast, estimate to grow at 39.5% uh, according to one estimate uh, of uh, virtual assistants. So in the, in, in the area of uh, uh, asthma, uh, particularly we focus on pediatric asthma, we uh, measures, measure 29 different parameters, taking up to 1852 data points per patient per day. And then we can give you real time understanding of uh, all the data and what that data means to the patient healthcare. So one very interesting example could be that the patient is known to be um, uh, affected by rugby uh, severely. Uh, then, um, when patient uh, ask how is the uh, how is the weather today, the uh, assistant can say weather is great, but um, rugby is high. You may want to take your rescue medication with you, right? That kind of um, you know assistance, um, uh, if you can give. Current clinical care simply have no such capacity. If you can personalize, contextualize uh, using these kind of AI technologies, then this is really possible. Diet managers, management is another very major, uh, uh, you know, uh, case where we are developing nutrition management chatbot, and it is very exciting AI uh, project because you need image recognition, volume estimation, nutritional information, food recommendation. All of this involve different types of AI uh, technologies. Uh, and research and uh, it, the applications are type one diabetes and hypertension. Both of them we are involved in right now. And we work with clinicians. So uh, one of the interesting aspect of what we do is that we don't do uh, projects that are simply in our 
labs, a computer science lab, all, all the projects that I talked about are in actual collaboration with the people in those fields, with the industry, with the industry partners, with the uh, healthcare professional clinicians who actually do patient care. Uh, so there is a video of uh, of uh, this. I'll I'll send the link to Hemant about the talk. If anybody wants to uh, see that, there are multiple videos in this talk uh, that you can look up. AI in pharmaceutical. Again, um, you know, I had given a talk about AI in pharmaceutical, so I have a one hour uh, worth of um, uh, you know uh, uh, material on this. I'm going to just tell you one example. Uh, this example is very exciting. Um, uh, for me, one of the real uh, success stories. Uh, so our work was on, uh, we got funded by, a, you know, we, we got an NIH project. The same week, President Obama uh, created a national initiative, declared a national initiative on prescription drug abuse. And we said, we let's monitor social media where people very openly talk about their use of um, a drug uh, and uh, you know even the sale of drug and all kind of stuff um, a dark dark web uh, you can find all kinds of uh, drugs available for sale um, so we said let's monitor all these things and uh, see what we can learn from that so we work and uh, we work with epidemiologists and we made a legitimate medical discovery the discovery was that uh, users reported taking the anti diarrhea treatment drug lopramide same as imodium ad over the counter um, uh, to self-medicate from withdrawal symptoms. This was not known to the broadly to the medical community. After we uh, published our paper in 2013, uh, there were three or more toxicology studies that, that done to validate this finding uh, from, a, uh, from, a, from a scientific perspective. And in 2016, citing those toxicology studies, um, um, all the toxicology studies uh, you know, refer to our work as a, you know, uh, and then uh, in 2016, um, FDA came up with a warning on this matter. So wonderful, uh, you know, uh, you know, result on public health. Um, uh, during the pandemic, uh, we, uh, you know, the, there is a huge growth in, um, um, you know, mental health and addiction, and quality of life has uh, changed for many people. A uh, few it has improved, but some it has really gone down. So we analyzed massive amount of data. Uh, we have collected about 12 billion tweets and um, with uh, those kind of data, we um, studied mental health, uh, including depression, addiction, domestic violence. And um, again, you know, we were able to show how um, uh, different policy choices, for example, you know, um, uh, we know of a lot of problems. Uh, just today morning, uh, I heard the daily New York Times daily piece about a uh, huge change in public health. Uh, public health officials are being, you know, uh, under pressure because of the laws that now don't allow them to make decisions. And a um, uh, huge social issue about um, whether uh, there can be mandate or not mandate. Um, and, uh, be, you know, many of them are leaving public health. Um, so anyway, um, uh, but it would be important from scientific, scientific perspective to study the import, impact of uh, the choices that um, uh, people make, policy choice, and the impact on the quality of life, particularly through understanding of mental health and addiction and other things like that. So we did that, and how they uh, we could we could see the change uh, week by week, uh, month by month, uh, and and then connect that to the um, you know the choices that the. Uh, that, that those uh, communities, those uh, counties and state have made. And we can, uh, this shows you um, uh, the social quality, uh, what we call social quality index changing uh, over the period of time and what are the reasons behind that and so on and so forth. And how, for example, you know, so for example, uh, uh, there's a stay at home, uh, uh, you know, order and then what, uh, or, or extension school related uh, uh, thing and, uh, and, and how the quality changed. We could see all of that uh, here, uh, through this study. And we could even study here um, how, uh, for example, different demographics uh, such as um, uh, uh, millennial on the left hand side and Gen Z on the right hand side, I believe, uh, have reacted. Uh, 
uh, to various things like school disclosure, uh, work, uh, you know, uh, closures uh, or work from home or many other things like that. And uh, they have chosen to use different kinds of drugs, all those things we could study. Another major area is uh, disaster coordination. Uh, and so here, uh, you know, I have a, uh, you know, um, a nice video uh, shows um, um, real time collection of social media data, uh, you know, tweets and um, satellite images also, and uh, drone footages and uh, images in the social media and creating situational awareness and um, connecting with people who need medical help with the people who uh, agencies who can provide that, all that kind of stuff, how you can do using tools. Uh, we have a, a, a project going on right now as you speak to understand uh, importance of misinformation uh, in decision making for public health and disaster coordination tasks. This is an NSF convergence project. Um, then we have project, uh, you know, with, with um, you know, uh, education is a major area uh, where we are pushing uh, uh, and uh, it's also a huge growth market. You can see, in fact, 47% uh, CAG are estimated. And, and there is a huge use uh, of, of AI techniques. Uh, uh, there are companies, I mentioned the name of a company in India called, by, you know, it is funded by uh, Reliance, which is the major, biggest industry house in India. And I work also work with a, um, a company um, uh, founded by ex uh, UT Knoxville professor uh, 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 in education, and uh, so there's a lot of work going on, uh, you know, in this area, uh, in which we are working on uh, changing uh, using AI for using analogy-based pedagogy in classroom. Uh, and currently discussing with one, uh, you know, uh, big company, um, uh, big big industry. Uh, a big bank uh, about possibly them funding us to further uh, expand our work. So there are many uh, value to education. So um, looking at the time, so far I've talked about AI success, but um, at the same time, AI remains quite hyped and AI still has a long way to go. So, um, you know, Michael Jordan is a superstar in machine learning. And here is an article that just, um, you know, uh, that, 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 that is not, yeah, that is a little old now, uh, you know, but um, uh, not too old. And there, is, there are many more articles of this kind. He says, AI, uh, the revolution that has not happened yet. And um, here is another one by a cognitive scientist. The average AI system isn't smarter than a fifth grader. Uh, we need to build AI that captures how humans think. And um, if I want to now kind of give it at a high level, show it at high level, uh, there is a uh, entirely one hour talk on just this subject that I'm going to talk about in next uh, two or three slides. But basically, AI that we have focused so far on, which has also been successful, has done the tasks that uh, do not require high level of uh, human intelligence. Uh, they are addressing low level of human intelligence, possibly things that are more repeatable. Uh, so classification, prediction, recommendation, language processing, these things AI is already doing very, very well. But, so it is doing well with the narrow, well-defined task, uh, but it is uh, failing at uh, doing human-like broad spectrum behavior. Um, and, and, and hence, um, uh, uh, you know, we are far from incorporating high level uh, of intelligence into machines and that is uh, you know the technical uh, focus of of my own research now uh, so uh, for example uh, when the autonomous vehicle came to the um, uh, four um, uh, you know there were promises made that in five years or ten years we'll have you know self-running cars you know you won't need human and we have found out that uh, we are far from that in fact um, there is um, no known, uh, uh, you know, there are a lot of success in the area, including, you know, so we are working with Bosch, as I mentioned, and a lot of work going on here at top companies. None of them would, uh, you know, give us level five self-driving, which is the level of uh, driving that humans are uh, doing, right? So that, 
that would be where you can let the, uh, the uh, car drive for itself without human being in the loop. That none of them think so. And, and this has taken 10 years to figure out that we are simply far from being able to do that, right? So there are many reasons. And uh, what we miss is some high level capabilities that humans have and current AI don't have. Abstraction, contextualization, personalization, analogy, causality. And uh, so, so there is a lot more that can be talked about it. And in fact, it so happens that we work on causality, we work on analogy, work, work on all of these topics that I have uh, um, and so that we can impact uh, future uh, applications of AI. Um, uh, knowing the time, I you know won't be discussing that right now. Maybe it will come up in our question answering. Uh, this shows you uh, the AI Institute and uh, in the center shows some of the AI disciplines they are very, very working on. This is a, a more than a year old slide. So we are doing even more than what you see there. And on the right, uh, on the outer side, you see all our translation research, all of, uh, uh, well, actually this is again, as I said, year old slide. So it has further, um, you know, grown, um, but, um, but, but these are some of the things. So this is how we have, we have built our uh, system. Um, if you want to know more about it, the best place is to follow us on the LinkedIn. Already have, uh, I'm very proud that we have uh, 5,000 some followers growing very fast. And, um, um, you know, hopefully that means we, we are making impact. Um, okay. So that with that, let me, um, um, you know, end here and open up for conversation. Questions uh, for Amit? Excellent presentation, Amit. Uh, I think uh, very motivating. Mm -hmm. Pleasure. Mm -hmm. I hello, hello, Doctor um, Amit. I actually have two questions. <laughs> so my first question is perfect for Veterans Day. It's about AI in the military, and I understand that the U.S. is ahead of every other country in AI skills. But I've read articles that say, um, like I have Politico, Politico pulled up in front of me, and it says there are publicly available documents that show how Chinese progress, progress in military IA, progression in military IA is being driven in part by access to American technology and capital. And it just goes on to say that there's this race between the United States and China um, when it comes to AI and how China is on its way to um, surpassing the U.S. So could you kind of share your opinion about that, about AI in the military? And then my second question is, which you actually just touched on, it's just the downside of using AI and the maybe dangers of AI. Could you just talk more about that? And just, I guess the question is, how do we find that balance? Because yeah, I know both, both are, um... Excellent questions, and uh, I um, uh, certainly could have, uh, you know, talked a lot more about it. My own view is that uh, uh, what you have read in that article is largely correct. Uh, in that um, uh, other, in the, I had one slide very early on that showed, uh, you know, AI in terms of market. I showed AI in terms of, um, uh, you know. Uh, 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 investment and I also showed AI in terms of skills and um, uh, there are a lot of things that uh, is are happening in the US um, that have been uh, and, and uh, you know and what others have chosen to do which has not worked well for US um, certainly um, the Chinese espionage has been for real but it is a complex issue in that yes they have done that but at the same time stopping from bright talent to come to us would also hurt us so how do you find that balance is a very uh, challenging issue but more importantly um, for, uh, there are um, uh, and i'm going to still you know going to talk about that high level and quickly countries like china uh, has um, certain advantage uh, as far as ai is concerned the advantage is that they can collect the data with le less super oversight than US can. And US can uh, collect the data with less oversight than Europe can. So there are uh, societal 
aspects and the fact that there are you know democracies versus non democratic and you know, authoritarian institutions which have different choices that they can make so uh, the type of ai which uh, is driven by access to large amount of data uh, countries like china would have advantage to the other advantage that they have is that they have systematically exploited through espionage through this hacking uh, that is for real uh, so many websites, including military websites, um, has been, you know, hacked and all the information has been. So we may invest years to uh, create some finding, but then it's available to all the world without having to invest all that it is. This is not entirely all loss cost, because at the end of the day, it is not just the finding or knowledge we have, but it's our ability to continue to find more is important. That's why I would like to emphasize the investment in the people uh, is very important uh, and um, for, our, our, for us to have continued advantage or at least, uh, you know, and, uh, uh, and compete, we we'll need to invest in our people and, um, uh, and, and uh, thus, even if somebody finds out what we can do now, we can always better it, right? So that is something that you have to uh, uh, continue to do. Um, uh, there are um, there is other major issue uh, is on points that uh, some countries and particularly China has done far more investment in AI and other technologies than US has. Um, uh, we had uh, an administration that in the la you know last four years had very little investment. Um, in, in science and technology, uh, or there, there was no one. So the National Science Foundation, National Institute of Health, DOD funding. Uh, uh, some of them coming to research had, had not done too well for, well, not only in the last admission, for quite many administrations, really the investment, compared to the growth in some other countries, which has been far higher. We are, we are picking that up. So I showed the slide where US is, you know, recognized, for example, um, so that uh, hopefully will catch up or help us somewhat, but um, our ability to invest is still lower than other, some of the countries today. We are no longer the most rich, richest country in, in some sense, or we are rich, but um, our investment are being, uh, you know, have to be spread in many different ways uh, that some other countries uh, don't have to do that. They can invest a lot more in technology. So that is one thing coming to your second question which is extremely important this is a, there's a big issue of trust in ai and um, one of the biggest problem is bias so so uh, think about us uh, you and i represent uh, you know uh, brown skin and dark skin people and when you look at for example um, uh, imagenet on which it is a large corpus of images on which you train your ai algorithm well, when you look at that, uh, the number of people uh, with, uh, you know, uh, that, that, that are not, um, you know, um, uh, Caucasian or, or white skin is a small fraction, right? So with that, that bias, it, it comes, to, you know, directly into the system. If you train um, to recognize on that, those algorithms have failed to recognize people with brown and black, you know, color skins. And this is just one example. I can give you tons of example. Other example is that um, there is a chatbot uh, that was put online and very quickly um, uh, people, uh, you know, train it to become racist, right? Uh, so there is a constant, uh, uh, you know, how to make your technology, uh, 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 you know, foolproof from this kind of um, wrong, uh, you know, uh, things as well as how do you, make them fair, less bias, that is uh, ethical. That's a huge focus. Thankfully, I must uh, say credit that uh, funding agency and government and uh, industry are increasingly aware of it. There have been a lot of missteps, but they're increasingly aware of it and there is interdisciplinary work going on. One of the first thing I did when I started AI Institute was to set up a um, you know, uh, in, in ethic board, you know, AI ethics board, or, or you know, and and I have a, uh, I had a psychologist, I had a business uh, person, 
you know, uh, I had um, uh, uh, person from social sciences and humanities, and I had uh, you know computer scientists and so on and so forth. And 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 so these uh, you know something we have to do. Uh, there is growing uh, investment in making AI ethical and trustworthy. Okay, thank you. Great question, Sydney. Thank you. Next question. I put a question in the chat box. Um, oh, okay. I'd, I'd be interested to know how big your institute is, how many PIs, how many faculty, how many students. Uh, good question. So we just started in 2019, and we started by uh, five or six of my team members moved with me uh, in fall of 2019. Um, we have grown very fast. So the, uh, so the uh, commitment I got was to be able to hire 10 uh, faculty, um, uh, 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 five in core AI and five in interdisciplinary AI. Now, of these 10 uh, slots, uh, I have hired uh, five so far. Uh, so, I mean, I chair the search committee and, uh, you know, we are the university wide search committee, and uh, we have been able to hire five with me. We are now six faculty in the AI Institute. Additionally, in the computer science department, we have, um, you know, another five, six, seven faculty who also do AI. Um, if you talk about the AI Institute alone, uh, the uh, institutional commitment was to invest $1 million per year for five years. And um, in addition to that, uh, we got the funds to compl uh, uh, complete our space. So we got commitment of entire floor of a, of a building, uh, 20,000 square feet, of which um, uh, we started out with a, a little over a million dollars to complete 10,000 square feet. And we are going to, uh, we are starting the process of completing the other 20,000 20, 20, 10,000 square feet because in this short time we have grown enough to occupy all of the 10,000 square feet we have. Uh, so uh, with the uh, five, six faculty, uh, we currently have uh, uh, three um, uh, postdoc and that level of people. And uh, we have um, uh, about 15 to 20 PhD students and we have masters and undergraduate students. And we have very uh, uh, robust uh, group of interns that work many remotely. Uh, <clears throat> total physical um, uh, people in the you know uh, in the building is somewhere between twenty five and thirty on, uh, on on our thing, meaning faculty students who are working on these postdocs. And total uh, virtual people is around thirty five or slightly more than that. Um, and that does not include. Um, all the co-PIs with whom we have joint research. So if you go to AIISC.ai, our website, and click on project tab, you will see 22 projects, funded project listed. So that page only listed lists funded project. It does not list unfunded project. So right now, as we speak, I have uh, around 20 funded active projects. And 90%, um, in, in, in 80 to 90% of them are interdisciplinary. So in each of them, I have a clinician or a mechanical engineer faculty or social science faculty or communication faculty or education faculty. Uh, so the, um, outside of the core 30 some people in AI, there is this whole ecosystem of uh, collaborators from other things that are all engaged in the AI research, uh, research and uh, translational research. Thank you very much. Next question. Uh, I have a question. Um, how are you guys using blockchain by any chance to help you guys with like AI or anything like that? Or blockchain still not in the use for real? No, blockchain is in use for real, but uh, a blockchain is not primarily an AI uh, technology. So it is not a an area of uh, emphasis or focus or expertise in the AI Institute. Uh, there is a uh, another area of concentration in our uh, you know, in our college and in our, uh, you know, Department of Computer Science and Engineering uh, on cybersecurity. And clearly, you know, blockchain is uh, uh, a key piece of uh, software uh, or, or technology that is in use there. And uh, there are 
you know, where AI is being applied, uh, such as to finance and other things, blockchain is going to be relevant and will be relevant. Uh, so the technologies for real is just not considered to be a core AI technology, so we are not working on it. But uh, we won't be adverse to using it when, when it makes sense. Can, can I ask another question? Please. Um, <clears throat> what's your infrastructure look like in the, in, the, in the institute? I don't mean the physical space, I mean the, the computational infrastructure, the connectivity, um, so um, spe special purpose processors, uh, so on and so forth. Sure. Uh, uh, because large number of our projects do, do deep learning, computational infrastructure plays a very important role in what we do. So um, uh, there are two things that happen. I chose, uh, I built companies. So I built, uh, you know, for my companies, data centers. I chose not to build a data center. Uh, for myself. Instead, I uh, first started working with the uh, research com uh, computing infrastructure of the whole university. And um, uh, thankfully, they were very open to that. Thankfully, as I mentioned, uh, I started with, you know, uh, the 10 dean meeting with 10 deans. And so there's, a, you know, university wide support for that. So uh, their, their HPC, uh, high performance computing and storage immediately became available to my team. Then we chose to invest invest hundred thousand dollars in GPU cluster. As uh, currently, uh, although that may be changing in five years, currently uh, GPUs uh, play huge uh, you know role in uh, this deep learning uh, you know high high end computational uh, work. We have to train large language model, or we have to do uh, image processing or video. You know, so <clears throat> uh, uh, we uh, uh, we. All our faculty got a um, decent uh, startup and we said each of us will contribute $25,000 to this cluster that will be uh, for AI Institute. And um, by investing initial $100,000, I was able to get the latest NVIDIA uh, A100 based um, you know, uh, cluster with uh, um, five petaflop uh, uh, you know, uh, computational capability, which is pretty good for what you want. I mean, this is not the same as um, what uh, uh, University of Florida or Indian University get. So University of Florida got a $60 million donation from NVIDIA. And large percentage of that money goes to, um, uh, you know, I, to, to buying uh, high-end computational infrastructure. So what we have is, uh, has worked out very good. It was a very smart decision on our part where we invested our money very wisely, $100,000 is not that hard. And if I wanted, I could have invested more time in writing a in infrastructure grant, hopefully winning it to expand it. Thankfully, this has uh, not become a, uh, 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 we, we, I'm not hearing from my students that they are not able to get uh, the work done. Problem occurs when they try to run their algorithm in their laptop or you know desktop, and then say it's not running. When they start, uh, and they, they need to learn how to use the backend uh, computational thing, Kubernetes or other things that you need to do, uh, and uh, use the backend uh, thing uh, effectively. And when they do that, they don't have a problem right now. Thank but you very this, much. This equipment is using heavily already. Other questions? So uh, I do have a question for you, Amit. Uh, so uh, I think, as you said, that the AI effort more and more is moving to kind of built in the higher level intelligence uh, into the computing, uh, which the humans can do much easily, uh, like uh, um, abstractions and other things. Uh, so what's your thought on the uh, kind of the choice between trying to teach the computer the higher level human capabilities which humans can do very very easily versus using the ai and the computer to really augment the human's capability uh, in the things which humans are not good so i see most of the research efforts and a lot of research efforts of the ai community going into replicating what humans can do okay instead of augmenting what humans can do or help them uh, mm, augment what we are really weak at. 
Uh, what's your thought on that? Well, this is a lovely question, um, uh, very close to my heart. Um, uh, uh, in 2008, um, I wrote a piece, a vision piece called Computing for Human Experience and uh, gave a you know, bunch of keynotes also on that. And it was exactly on the question you asked uh, and that saying, um, you know, the AI it comes and, and AI, uh, you know, what, what AI should do comes in many uh, flavors. But among the major are, you know, there's a continuum on the one end is a Marvin Minsky type of AI. AI to replace humans. And uh, then there are there have come other visions, intermediate um, uh, vision by uh, 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 Lick Lider uh, and uh, vision by uh, uh, Robertson and vision by um, uh, uh, the guy who wrote uh, um, Competing for 21st Century. But they were the visions where <clears throat> AI and humans collaborate. <clears throat> at different levels of in, in that continuum okay and then uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, on the other end is uh, what I call computing when experience where AI is there to improve human life uh, but by and large um, I personally don't subscribe or, or work on too much on the AI that replaces human too much uh, we work on things where AI and human are uh, partners in some way. There are a uh, task um, uh, that humans don't do that efficiently. And that machines should then do that. There are tasks that even humans can do. It is inefficient from economic perspective. Let machines do that. And then there are tasks that humans can do well, but by combining human with the machine, uh, you will have more productivity. So those are uh, valuable two things. Things plus also important for me is where human is doing very little, but machine is working towards making human life better on its own, or or with li limited human involvement. Meaning human remains decision maker, or human takes the action, but human does not do a whole lot of nothing that replaces uh, uh, AI or technology. So many of this healthcare thing we do, it is there to, uh, in, it should involve, um, we, we do active sensing and passive sensing. Active sensing is where human is involved in giving some information to the machine. And passive sensing is that, you know, machines computing able to do that automatically. I can get from the web, what is um, uh, pollen count and air quality in your area. Um, and and so uh, we want to we, in my research I maximize passive sensing where humans have, does not have to do active work, uh, minimize active sensing. Sometimes humans have to be involved, and then work towards getting the results that will, if the humans use it, would help uh, improve human life. For example, prevention of asthma attack, or making better food choice and making sure that you are within your type one diabetes carbohydrate budget. So uh, generally speaking, uh, you know, these are the choices that AI researchers make all the time. And I'm more, I'm perfectly happy with not having level five uh, car, uh, you know, uh, uh, thing. Uh, even level four is very, very useful for economy and, and what we can do. So um, uh, yeah, that's, that's really the thought. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, well, if uh, there are no questions, uh, I'd like to thank Amit very much for uh, excellent talk and excellent question answer sessions. And uh, we appreciate it very much uh, sharing with us and uh, we look forward to see you again. And My pleasure. You. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye Steve. Bye. Bye everyone. Thank you.